Hey, what is up there, YouTubers? Edmonton Dog here. We are at the Grand Prix for Pittsburgh at the David L. Lawrence Convention Center. So, uh, this is the uh, room of gaming. This is where we're at. We have the uh, whole shindig going on there. There's a ton of players and everything going on here. So, uh, I pre-registered online, didn't have to worry about registering or anything like that online, so... And we'll start pretty much promptly this morning at 9 a.m. Uh, we have, like, all the venues going on here, Alter Realities there. Who else is here? Troll and Toad's here. We used to work for them. Uh, cool stuff's here. Lots of awesome stuff going on here, so... Uh, we'll see. Uh, hopefully I can meet some people some cool people here. I know that there were a couple of people that said that they were coming out to actually um, play here and we're going to stop by and say hi and stuff like that. So, yeah, we'll see. Uh, hopefully it ends up being really good. Hopefully I can get some good pulls and we can make it to uh, day two here and we can go off and actually play for some of the real money and stuff like that. So, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see. I'll keep you guys updated with what's going on with the Grand Prix. There we have it. So I just wrapped up the uh, deck construction portion. We did the sealed deck swamp. We registered our list, swapped it up. I ended up playing um, red, white, and black. So Borzov, Oros, or Dega, whatever you guys want to call it. Pulled Angelic Skirmisher and uh, the six drop guy that deals damage uh, based on the mnemonic creatures. Foundry Champion, that's, that's what it is. I couldn't think of it. Uh, got some Kingpins pets, a little bit of removal. Uh, it looks good. It looks pretty good. We're doing eight rounds here for day one and one round of day two for the cut. So it should be interesting. Um, it's definitely going to be nice to see if, uh, if I'm able to make the cut and uh, go and play in day two, which would be awesome. It would definitely be awesome. But uh, we're just going to play as best as we can. We're going to play appropriately and try to make it. No buys for today, so unfortunately I'm going to have to play through all eight rounds without... Uh, any just free wins there unless somebody doesn't show up or something like that but yeah we'll see uh round one is about to start we have like i think like less than a minute left on the uh on the time there actually like two minutes left for uh the actual deck registration and everything like that so yeah we'll see we'll see but uh yeah good times catch up to you guys uh, in a little bit here i needed like the croconora is the only reason i want to there's nothing that fills that slot. You're playing Esper and you go up against the Boros that you play. I got an hour. So just got done with round one, uh, ended up going two and one, so I won round one up against uh, another Boros, or not Boros, Orzov matchup, I was thinking Borzov. Um, so one against the Orzov matchup, two, one, um, just walking around here and waiting for the next round to start. So hopefully, uh, hopefully I can keep on winning and keep on doing good. I also was walking around and I happened to see a few pros, uh, including Melissa De Tora. So we're going to turn around here and uh, try and spy, spy and snoop, spy and snoop a little bit. Let's see if I can just go in and uh, go in and creep a little bit. I hope Fisher's going in. Uh, so, yeah, let's see, let's see if we can snoop, snoop spy a little bit. Spy. Is anybody, anybody else here that I know? Nope. Whole lot of nothing. Guy in a suit. Looking snazzy. Looking classy. People are still playing, still in round one. Got some people standing around here. You go through, not bump into people, not kill everybody on, in the process here. People playing around. I swore I just saw her. She's seriously just standing right there. Now I feel like a liar. Yeah. Alright, 
so it is the end of round three. So I scrubbed a little bit. Um, I ended up going 2-1, two, 2-1 one, two, one for the first two rounds, then 1-2 in the last round here. So it kind of sucks a little bit um, that I am 2-1 and one here. We we're playing nine rounds. I think initially I said that we were only playing eight rounds. Uh, we're playing nine rounds for day one, and then they're doing one day two round as well uh, today here as well. So, um, yeah, I'm 2-1 so far. Hopefully I don't lose again, um, or that I don't lose two more times, but I would like to cut into uh, the second day here. So we'll see how it goes. Um, I also stopped and talked to Brad Nelson. Uh, he's here as well. He's had two buys, so he just started playing uh, this round. I also got his uh, signature there. So that was kind of cool. Uh, stopped and talked to him for a little bit. But yeah, we'll see uh, how the rest of the rounds go. I'm going to catch up with some people and see how they are doing. So unfortunately, guys, my first-hand coverage of the event ends after round three. Now, going into round four, uh, I had high hopes of winning the round, and it went into game three, and I was about to win. I was actually one turn away from beating down my opponent and just winning with flyers. Um, and then my opponent just happened to get a really lucky draw off of top deck mode, uh, being that he had no cards in hand, and uh, if he didn't draw a response, uh, I would essentially have a game. And turns out he had Domri Raid in his deck, which I didn't see games one or games uh, or game two, so ended up I lost uh, round four. So um, with a two and two record, having five rounds left and um, me having to go undefeated for five more rounds to actually make it into day two, uh, it was really unrealistic that I would have been able to do it, especially with my sealed pool. Uh, looking at some of the other sealed pools that people had, especially uh, with the two guys that I played against that I lost to, there's, their pools were really, really good. Like They had really solid stuff. Uh, one of the biggest reasons why professional players don't like sealed Grand Prix is just because there's a decent amount of luck. There's a lot of skill that um, goes into playing sealed, but there's also a lot of luck that goes into um, determining how well you can potentially do and the kind of scope of um, where you can actually do good and how far you can actually make it with your deck. Um, at a certain point, you're just going to get into people that have much better pools than you. And sure, you can outplay some of them. You're supposed to. Um, if you're a good, good enough player, you can outplay um, even better cards. However, there's just a certain point where your opponents have ridiculous stuff and you just can't outplay them. Um, looking at uh, some of the seal pools, like I said, um, for instance, Jerry Thompson, uh, one of the professional players that was there, looking at his seal pool, his seal pool was like a lot better than mine and I actually have mine um, still here, which I'm going to be going over uh, in a bit here in the video. But looking at Jerry Thompson's seal pool that he had and the cards that he had, like I also had a skirmisher like he did as well, but he had like Death Pack Angel, which Death Pack Angel is incredibly hard to deal with unless you have like um, Angelic Edict or something like that. Um, but his pools were a lot better than mine. Uh, they were much more cohesive. My stuff was good. It got me through the first two rounds with a win, but um, after that point, I... I just wanted to do side events. I just wanted to have fun and play with uh, the rest of the group that was there and grind up more events for more uh, Planeswalker points because the multiplier is still pretty good for the side events. The main event's like an eight times multiplier, but the side events still had a decent multiplier. So uh, we all figured we would do side events, do standard, do some drafting and stuff like that and just kind of make the best of it. So um, I actually have a standard deck that I was using for the standard side events. Um, so I'm going to share that with you guys. I also have one of my draft pools that I did for a um, side event that I still have constructed. I wanted to keep it just so I could share one of those with you. Uh, just because it was a really nuts... I drafted really well for that one, so I wanted to share that with you guys. Um, as well as the, the sign token that I have from uh, Brad Nelson whenever I had the opportunity to talk to him. Uh, he's a really cool dude. Uh, we talked for just a couple of minutes there. Um, I said that I liked his work. I liked what he does with Evan Irwin on the channel, all like the um, the set reviews and stuff like that, the funny videos and stuff like that. He's a really cool dude. He's he's really uh, he's really nice to talk to. Um, some other pros that were there: uh, David Ochoa was there, LSV was there, Melissa Detora, 
Um, I was actually surprised. One of the things that I was actually surprised about was that um, David Ochoa and Melissa De Tora had a feature match, and it actually wasn't even um, put onto Wizards' website. I guess maybe it wasn't a good matchup or something like that. Maybe it wasn't a good game, or I don't even know what happened. But I distinctly remember them calling David Ochoa and Melissa De Tora to the feature math, uh, the feature match booth, if I can talk today. Um, and they wanted to have a feature match with them. So I was, I was a little bit surprised that they actually didn't uh, have that feature match or any information about it going on on uh, the Wizards website. But um, th there were some pros there. But um, one of the things that Brad actually mentioned was the fact that pros just don't like sealed because it's, it's a little bit of luck. There's, there's always some luck going on with it. Um, drafting is much more skill-oriented. It's much harder to do. Um, honestly, if they changed it to where, um, like day one and day two were draft based, which, uh, they had 1600 people that actually attended. It was like 1623 or something like that. I don't remember the exact number. Um, the head judge announced it like whenever we first started, but, um, having to do like day one drafting with that many people would be really hard, especially for players that don't know what's going on with drafting. They don't know the rules. Maybe it's like their first time at a Magic event, which uh, there was one kid, there's a, there was like a 12-year-old kid sitting next to me um, during round one, and my opponent across from me was fairly seasoned because he, he knew exactly what he was doing. And uh, we were like both going back and forth with like life totals, keeping track of stuff. So it was really good. I really like players that are um, that into it and know exactly what they're doing. But the player that was next to me, um, it was a 12-year-old kid, um, because he even mentioned it, he was like, I'm only 12 and this is my first Magic tournament. Um, but like, he had the most nuts pools that I have ever seen. Uh, he had like, Assemble the Legions, Fire Main Avenger, uh, he dropped Gideon at one point. Like, this kid had the most ridiculous Boros deck, and um, I was actually curious to see how, like, how well he actually did, but... Um, there are always players that it's their first event and they don't really know a whole lot of what's going on. Um, they're having their opponent judge call on them all the time to like get them kicked out of the game and give them like just free wins and stuff like that. So I think like if they did drafting for like day one, there would obviously be a lot of problems. It would be really hard to run that, but um, I would like it because drafting is more skill oriented. I really like drafting and I do really well with it, or at least I think I do. Um, uh, I post all my pictures on, on my channel Facebook of what all stuff that I draft and all my draft results. And I actually did um, around 15, I want to say 15 events between Thursday and Friday before the actual Grand Prix. Um, I want to say that I did 10 drafts of which I won 8 of them. And then I did 5 sealed events of which I went... I want to say that I went three and one in two of them, and four and zero oh in three of them. Or that was like backwards. It was either one or the other. It was either backwards or I had it exactly right. Uh, but either way, I did like a decent amount of events the two days before that, just to practice a little bit. Um, drafting, I practice a lot more just because that's a little bit more difficult to do, and um, you want to just kind of get the hang of things and what all cards are in this set. And you just want to kind of practice more and more for that because that's where like the real skill lies is drafting. That really weeds out the good players from the bad players. If you don't know how to draft, even if you make it to day two, you're not going to make the cut into like top eight or anything like that. Um, that's really where they just start making the cut into where the good players lie. Um, but yeah, overall, it was it was a really fun experience. It was really nice. I don't really get the opportunity to go to a lot of bigger events just because of traveling. Um, I would like to, like, if there was more, uh, if there were more events that were, like, closer around the Pittsburgh area, like, because I live in Pittsburgh, um, if there was more stuff going on, oh, on in, like, Columbus and, like, the Ohio region, um, stuff like that, I would definitely go to a lot more of them, but having a Grand Prix come into a local area uh, is definitely really nice. It gives you an opportunity where you don't have to travel very far and you actually get to enjoy yourself, but... Um, if it was constructed, I probably would have done a lot better. Uh, I would have had a a lot better chance at getting into day two, at least I think, because um, I'm a lot better at playing constructed than I am with 
uh, playing sealed, and I'm a lot better at drafting than I am at playing sealed, but I'm definitely a lot better at playing constructed than I am at drafting, so um, with that whole like rock, paper, scissors kind of ordeal there, uh, I would have done a lot better if it would have been a constructed event, so I don't know. Overall, it was a fun experience. Uh, regardless of any results, any stuff like that, um, the the experience was, was really fun. I did a lot of side events. I had a lot of fun doing them. I grinded out four Planeswalker points. I made all of my money back and then some with um, the stuff that I won from side events. And overall, it was really fun. So if you guys have the opportunity to go to any Grand Prix, any events like that, uh, even if you're not playing in the main event, if you're just doing side events, it's definitely something to check out and something that you want to uh, go to and just to have some fun. So now we're going to jump to an overhead view and I'm going to show you some of the stuff that I used for the side events. All right, now first off, this is the playmat that we got for Grand Prix Pittsburgh. Uh, the first 600 people that registered were eligible to receive one of these and uh, they look pretty cool. Uh, they were pretty awesome looking. The only thing that I like, don't like about it is the actual like the text that they used for it. Um, and that they had like Pittsburgh like written like that. That's the only thing that's just, that's just kind of like offsetting about the uh, the play mat. But otherwise, like I really like the artwork that they used for it, and uh, it was pretty cool. Alongside with that, um, I also got the the promo Primeval Titan, which I think looks really awesome as well. So um, if I can just get some focus there, for some reason, like my my camera likes to not want to auto focus on stuff. So um, sometimes like cards are out of focus when I'm trying to have like the text be in focus for them but uh even still the primeval titan looks pretty awesome and it's pretty cool to have a promo to uh remember the event by uh if not all the cool people that i met and everything else that went along for the event and i also had some people that came up to me and recognized me and they uh i stopped and just said hi for a second and they're like oh hey we like your videos and um it's nice to see you here and stuff like that. So that was really cool. It was it was a really cool experience just to have people that actually recognize me um, out of the crowd. And uh, it was really awesome. So uh, the first thing that I wanted to share with you guys is actually the, the sealed deck that I used for the event. So this is what I registered and what I used for the four events before I dropped or the four rounds before I dropped. Um, so first off, I have Death's Approach just as a one of. I have one mugging. Uh, one Syndic, uh, Syndic of Tithes, um, a Basilicus Creature, uh, Rite of Precinct 6, a Viscopa Guild Mage, uh, Wojak Halberdiers, True Fire Paladin, a Orzhov Charm, Executioner Swing, Devour Flesh, uh, one Aerial Maneuver, I also had one in the side, but I pretty much didn't end up signing it. The only time I sided it in was in round one, uh, which it was up against another Orzhov matchup. And I needed, like, more things where I could just trade. Because it was, like, a lot of two-power stuff. Um, he had um, Kingpin's Pets, and I had Kingpin's Pets. So I figured, like, whenever he swings, like, he didn't play any tricks or any stuff like that. So I had Aerial Maneuver. I would just block. And he thought, like, oh, all right, we're going to trade. And then I just drop Aerial Maneuver. So I sided in one more for that. Um, but I did have two Kingpin's Pets. Um, two Slate Street Ruffians that were more so filler than anything else. I guess it's an alright card, but I like it more as filler if I need slots filled. Um, I also had one uh, Court Street Denizen, a Millennial Gargoyle, which was the only four drop that I had, which was kind of weird. Uh, it was kind of like, a, it was a little bit awkward just to not have anything like in the four slot. So I ended up putting in one Millennial Gargoyle, which... Uh, was pretty fun. It's another flyer that can hit in for a decent bit, and it doesn't require any mana, so it can kind of let you play around with, like, awkward stuff, because I was splashing red for Foundry Champion, um, and other stuff like mugging and, uh, the other two red cards, but, um, Millennial Gargoyle was pretty alright, just because even in, like, a situation where you don't, if, if you're casting, like, um, Executioner's Swing, and you don't have, like, an extra white or black mana, left to extort or something like that like millennial gargoyle is good because it doesn't require any specific mana to it um i also had two night watch in here which were pretty fine against blocking other things and it also allows you to swing in and have blockers if your opponent uh swung in the previous turn so um night watch was pretty decent and uh one debtor's pulpit which i actually really like this card i like it for drafting 
Um, it's a pretty solid five drop just because it allows you to have that one land where you can just tap down your opponent's things. And this was actually the card that brought me about pretty much the most success, especially in round four uh, when I was about to win. It was pretty much off of Debtor's Pulpit just because I kept on tapping down um, my opponent's things because he was playing Naya and he just had all of the ridiculous bulky guys and I was just like, all right, well, I'm just going to keep ta keep tapping down your one guy that is significant. The rest of your guys aren't going to be swinging because they're not big enough to do so. Um, but the one debtor's pulpit ended up getting me um, pretty far. But ultimately, like in round four, like I mentioned, the guy the guy just top decked an awesome card and beat me off based off of that. Uh, I also had Angelic Skirmisher, which Skirmisher is just nuts. Uh, it's probably one of my favorite rares out of... Uh, gate crash and it's a really good one uh, just allowing your creatures to have first strike vigilance or lifelink at the beginning of each combat so yours and your opponents is really solid um, i also had the find your champion which was pretty good for removal for any like significant creatures that you need to get rid of enters the battlefield deals damage to target creature or player equal to the number of creatures you control and you can also um, fire breathe with them to give him extra power or you can um, use the second ability to give him extra um toughness as well so it was pretty solid for that and then i had my mana base which was um when ors off guild gate would have been awesome to have more fixing um unfortunately i only had one fixing in that color um and then i had some basics so i had three four five six seven planes and i think six swamps uh so one two three four five six and then i had three mountains for the splash um, which was pretty appropriate. Uh, the only time I actually got flooded or had mana problems was in round three. And uh, it was round three, game three, and I just got flooded. I, I just had all the lands, all, all the bread, and absolutely none of the meat that I needed out of my deck. Uh, so I ended up losing base off of that, which, I mean, it happens. It happens uh, with anything, um, with any type of like limited or even constructed events. Uh, it always happens here and there where you just kind of get screwed based off of your lands. Um, so really the only stuff that I actually ended up citing was like one Marshall's Glory and one Pit Fight. Pit Fight didn't make the main board just because I have like a lot of small things. I don't have anything significant in power where I can just be like, all right, well, my 5-4 gets rid of your 2-2 with Extort. Uh, all of my creatures were fairly small. The only, uh, the only time that I really cited it in was against other Orzhov matchups where... It was, all right, well, I have two twos, you have two twos. Um, I'm going to get rid of, like, one of my, uh, court, uh, like, Court Street Denizen to get rid of one of your extort creatures or something like that. So you get value out of it. Um, so that was the only time that I really cited that because in Orzhov, it's not really that amazing. And I had one Marshall's Glory um, up against, it, there was one Gruel matchup where the guy tried to, the guy had a few pit fights, um, so I think he had like two or three pit fights. So I ended up siding in Marshall Glory, uh, where he just couldn't win the pit fight trade. So uh, I cited that, and it actually helped me in that. But um, ultimately, these were the only two cards out of my entire seal pool that were worth actually using as sideboard elements. Um, other than that, the rares that I pulled were uh, one Simic Manipulator. I had a Giant Ataphage. Um, I had a Breeding Pool, a Watery Grave, uh, and these were the other rares that I pulled aside from my Foundry Champion and Skirmisher. Um, and then I also had a Wasteline Viper Foil and a Foil uh, Beckon Apparition um, in here as well. So um, those weren't really that amazing, but I just wanted to note foils. Shiny stuff is always awesome, so uh, we have that. So that was my sealed deck for the main event. And... Now we are going to take a look at the token that I have. I just want to uh, share this with you guys. So this is the Brad Nelson token. I'll get this out and show you. It has a signature on there. And he actually wrote 3-3. Three, three. He crossed out. He like wrote over the 1-1 one, one and just wrote 3-3. Three, three. So uh, I'm going to be using it as a 3-3 three, three anyway. So um, it was cool to have that. Brad Nelson's a really cool guy. He was really, um, he was really nice to talk to. And... Um, He's really knowledgeable. He's really knowledgeable about magic. So it's always nice to have like some figures to look up to in terms of um, having this game and playing it and having recognizable figures. So the next thing that I wanted to share with you guys is the standard deck that I used, which was one of my 
uh, Esper builds. So this was actually a um, Super Friends build that I actually haven't put up onto the channel yet. So I'm going to do like an informal deck tech and show you what all I played for this deck. Um, and I use this for the standard side events. Um, the first off, I have two Snapcasters, the reoccur stuff. I have two Obsidots, which are just a house. Uh, one Liliana of the Veil, two Soren Lord of Innistrad, one Gideon Champion of Justice, which is just nuts in the control matchup. Um, they really, like, <laughs> control versus control, they really have a tough time with Gideon, and they end up just using, like, a Detention Sphere or something on him, um, which seemed to be the case, like, every single time. Uh, but Gideon is a house. I actually won with Gideon in one game just because of his ultimate, being able to blow up everything and still having Gideon after that. Um, so Gideon was awesome. I have one Tamiyo, uh, three Sphinx's Revelations, as you guys could imagine, in the Esper colors. Um, I have a playset of Azorius Charm to be able to draw or bounce stuff. Um, I also have two Think Twice to be able to draw and reoccur and draw again as just cantrips. Um, I have two Syncopate uh, for just being able to counter stuff, whether it's um, game one playing up against any... Uh, Rakdos' Returns, um, there was also like Thrag Tusks that I was countering in the um, Wolf Run Bant matchups, um, Restoration Angels as well. Uh, there's just a lot of stuff that Syncopate hits, hits into, and I wanted to have two of them in the main board. Uh, I also have three Devour Flesh against the really early aggro decks where you can just drop a turn two, get rid of something. Um, three Lingering Souls to either bash in your opponent's face or just have blockers and be able to grind out until the late game where you can drop actual threats and be able to just bounce back. Um, one Oblivion Ring, one Detention Sphere, uh, place it a Supreme Verdict for the aggro matchup just because aggro is like, it's really prominent. So, um, I have one, I have an entire play set of Supreme Verdict just to be able to deal with that, especially the Blitz decks because they're really annoying. Uh, aggro is really annoying right now. Um, I have two Merciless Eviction where you can pretty much get rid of anything. Uh, you can get rid of Planeswalkers, Enchantments, Creatures, or Artifacts where I was using it to either get rid of Creatures if I needed to, uh, especially in the Wolf Run Bant um, matchup just because my opponent had Angel of Serenity. So it was pretty crucial to get rid of their Creatures uh, so that they couldn't reoccur them with uh, Angel of Serenity or be able to put them back in their hand. Uh, so that was one thing. Another thing was being able to get rid of multiple Detention Spheres that my opponent had. So that was something that I liked doing. Um, and also being able to get rid of Planeswalkers. There was one Esper matchup where I got rid of um, my opponent's Tamiyo, just because it was a nuisance and I couldn't do anything about it other than just drop Merciless Eviction on Planeswalkers. Um, but I also used it quite frequently to get a, rid of uh, Witchbane Orb to be able to use um, Nefalia Drownyard in order to mill out my opponents, which is one of the most prominent win conditions of this deck. Um, so that's some, um, all the non-land stuff. So then I have my lands, which are playset of Watery Graves, playset of Hollowed Fountains, playset of... Uh, Godless Shrines, uh, Playset of Drowned Catacombs. It's a three-color deck. You're pretty much bound to have a lot of duels. Um, three Glacial Fortress, three Isolated Chapel. Uh, I'm also running two Ghost Quarters for the Wolf Run Bant matchup. Uh, just because like a fair bit of the decks, um, actually most of the decks that I've run into, don't run any basics in them. So essentially it's a wasteland against their Wolf Runs. Um, so I, I had that in there. Um, and it's really nice, especially like I've had it where I was playing against Wolf Run Bant and my opponent just started off with playing um, Wolf Run and they were like, wow, I'm really screwed on my lands. So <laughs> I had Ghost Quarter in hand and I just played it and got rid of them. And he's like, well, I don't have any basic lands in my deck. So um, it was a pretty easy matchup <laughs> right there. When your opponent doesn't have any lands and essentially they just shuffle their deck off of that, it's really nice. Um, and then I have two Nefalia Drown Yards as a win condition just to be able to mill out my opponent. So um, that was the main board of the deck that I used. And then the sideboard, I had one Shimmy Inspector just as a single 10 for the uh, mid-range and the control matchups, like Jun mid-range, any control variants, um, just to be able to... Played against them, they have to deal with it or else you swing in on them 
and you are able to look at their hand and essentially extirpate or surgical extraction them, search for something uh, that's in their hand and remove all copies that they have. Uh, so that's pretty good. Like control, you want control to like waste something on this card, um, just like a supreme verdict or something stupid like that. Uh, and oftentimes your opponent's just gonna drop something like that, like supreme verdict just on one creature because Shimmy Inspector is really powerful against uh, the control matchup. So I had one of those just as a singleton. Uh, I had three duress, uh, one psychic spiral against the other mill matchups, uh, one snapcaster mage to side in um, whenever I need to reoccur more things, especially like counter spells. One Jace memory adept in order to be able to mill out my opponent. Um, two negates. I have some graveyard hate as well. So two rest in peace and two purify the grave. So against the combo reanimator decks, I side in all four, but against the um, the more like not really combo oriented style of reanimator decks, the decks that don't rely on uh, rely on it to actually win, but have it as a kind of a synergy alongside other things that they're doing with like being able to reoccur obs at odds, thrag tusks, like the junk reanimator builds. Um, so against them, I only side in three of them, but against the combo reanimator decks that entirely base their deck off of comboing off with reanimator, I side in all four. Uh, and then I have two Witchbane orbs for any decks that, um, try to target me, like, uh, Jun midrange, like, you don't let them use duress or slaughter games or even Rakdos as a return in bonfire. Uh, against control, control can't use Nefalia, Drown Yard, or, um, even if they get, like, uh, Liliana... Uh, of the veil where they can't select you to um they can't target you to use the minus two ability to make you sacrifice a creature um but yeah there's like there's like a lot of stuff that witchbane orb hits into and it's a it's a pretty good card to have in your sideboard so that was the standard deck that i used for side events and now the final thing that i want to share with you guys is one of the drafts that i did um so this is one of the drafts that i still have constructed and i wanted to share with you guys so um the draft uh overall deck that i had was one cloudfin raptor um i drafted three deaths approach and one of them was actually passed to me as the second to last card in a pack which uh deaths approach is not that bad like it's not the most amazing removal card but it, it should not be appearing second to last card in a draft like that was one of the weirdest things that i've ever had happen even with like how much i draft online uh, I have never had Death's Approach pass to me that late. Uh, but I also have one Paranoid Delusions, um, three Executioner's Swings, a Simic Flux Mage, uh, one Undercity Informer, a Slate Street Ruffian, uh, two Death Cult Rogues, a Psychic Strike, and I also had one more in the sideboard, um, two Syndic Enforcers, a Belstrad Spy, uh, Foil Keymaster Rogue, which is nice and shiny. Uh, Crypt Ghast, so we're getting into the bulky stuff now, and this is like the most awesome stuff. So Crypt Ghast is awesome with Extort. Um, Whispering Madness, Consuming Aberration, so like already, like I just have nuts cards. Um, and then two Totally Lost, I also drafted a Watery Grave, and this was out of my second pack. Like I opened up my second pack, and I was like, wow there is really nothing in this pack like it was the it was the jankiest pack that i've probably ever seen for a draft there's just like nothing good in it and the only thing was like watery grave so i was like all right well i might as well it's fixing for me because i already know what colors i'm going to be in so uh, i drafted watery grave i also had a demir guild gate and two orts off guild gates and then i had my basics as uh one two three four five six seven swamps I had one, two, three, four, five islands, and then just one single plains. Uh, the splash of white was for uh, executioner swing, and overall I had three sources of white, so that was pretty. That was pretty all right with how I had it, um, and it worked out really well anyway. So um, the distribution was really solid. Um, but like I said, I had one one psychic strike in the sideboard um, up against any match up against the matchups where. Um, my opponent was kind of like slow rolling. They were just trying to play out and just drop big things. And um, in one of the games, I sided it in just because of Assemble the Legion. Because my opponent drafted Assemble the Legion. And I was like, yeah, you're definitely not playing that next next game. Like, I'm just going to make sure you're not going to play that. So uh, I sided in one Psychic Strike. And I did, in fact, counter it off of 
um, Psychic Strike. So that was pretty solid. And the other two cards that I actually hate drafted, the rest of my draft pool was junk. Um, it was just stuff that was passed to me at the very end. But um, the two cards that I did hate draft were one Homing Lightning and a Fire Main Avenger because Fire Main Avenger is nuts. It's absolutely nuts in, uh, in Limited, and it's a really solid card. So I definitely wanted to hate draft that, and there was nothing else that I could have drafted uh, in my colors, and that was probably the best hate draft that I could have done out of that pack. So I decided to take that and not let somebody else have it. So uh, that was the draft pool. So overall, that was my experience for Grand Prix Pittsburgh. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. It was kind of lengthy, but ultimately it pretty much covers my entire experience of the event. If you enjoyed it, please be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe for more Magic the Gathering content. And until next time, guys, have yourselves a wonderful, fun-filled Magic the Gathering day.